to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Today on the show, I have a fellow Jersey girl, Meredith Huck, founder of House of Huck. You've heard me say on the show before that when I'm sometimes contacted through social media, something actually just piques my interest, right? I go, I check out your social media page, your website, all the things, and then sometimes I get sucked in. And this was the case with Meredith. She stopped me in my tracks when she shared three important points that she had learned from her first year in business, and she wanted to share them with you. I think you're going to be excited to hear these points that we talk about today. Just over two years in business, House of Huck has created timeless spaces focusing on fun- functionality and beauty while keeping lifestyle top of mind. Residing in coastal Connecticut now, we won't hold that against her, <laughs> with her husband and two young children, Meredith also works as a licensed real estate agent who enjoys supporting her clients in turning average homes into spectacular homes. A quick shout out and thanks to Revel Woods, who is sponsoring our Power Talk Friday tour this October 21st, 2022 in High Point. This one-day coaching event is an absolute accelerator to improving your business acumen and to broadening your relationships and contacts in the industry. You'll meet me, my husband, Vin, my cousin, Eileen, and John Dupre, the founder of Revel Woods. Revel Woods helps you integrate hardwood flooring, which is a high ticket profit center for your entire interior design business into your projects. Some of the ways that they help you do this include true wholesale pricing, allowing you to charge competitive pricing for comparable products from flooring retailers, protected branding, preventing you from being shopped, expert knowledge and service because Revel Woods walks you through the entire process and stays with you from initial sampling through installation. They'll even help you find an installer if that's what you need. It doesn't matter if you've been sourcing flooring for years or know absolutely nothing about hardwood flooring. Revel Woods takes care of it and helps you every step of the way. Go to revelwoods.com and check them out. Alrighty, so if you are in a career that you have been wanting to leave because you dream of a career in design, maybe you've been a little uncertain to do it, well, this episode is right for you. And I would say even if you've recently taken the plunge in opening your own interior design firm, there is definitely a thing or two that you could learn from Meredith as well. Here we go. Hi, Meredith. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so, you know, you're welcome, lady, because I just love, um, you know, I've said it on the show before and you're a listener of the show and you know this, but there are certain people that I've gotten to know through social. And it's usually because you start talking to me or, you know, saying something about the different episodes that um, are out. But then, you know, that it catches my eye and then I do the things that I do. I go to your profile and then I go to your website and I do all the things and, um, Um, so I feel like I know you, even though we haven't met in real life. And of course we have the Jersey girl connection here, right? Meredith? Do. Yes, exactly. So, um, born and raised in New Jersey, but you know, are now living out of state in Connecticut, but still in our little tri-state area here. So love that. And, um, after being, you know, sort of acquainted on Instagram for the last several months, you sent a pitch to me. And, you know, there are some pitches that just stop me in my tracks and I'm like, oh, yes, 
I want some of that. And I'm going to read the three lines that caught me because I think they will set up our conversation really nicely for our colleagues. You said, you don't need a creative background to succeed in a creative business. You can make more money in your first year than you had in your corporate career if you stay organized and disciplined. And you can get creative, example, barter in the beginning if you don't have the money to invest in your business. And these three things are all three of them. I'm like, I want some of that. I want that conversation. I want to know what that means to you. And then you also added that after you heard Katie McFarland on the podcast that you reached out and that you've been working with her. So that is another, you know, plus in my mind that you've gotten some value from the podcast and somebody that I really, you know, think is an amazing lady. You know, I love to find out that when I have an impression of feeling about somebody's expertise and skill set, especially when they're a consultant to the industry, when you know, listeners like yourself then go out and hire these individuals and you have positive experiences, that's like icing on the cake for me. So, um, so all the way around and on top of it, you said a video pitch, which also was adorable. I did. Thanks to Katie. She gave me that recommendation, not to pitch you, but just said how important video is these days. Yes. So good. I'm glad you loved it, Luann. I did. I really did. And so, so let's talk about this. Like, let's just, let's talk about it in the order that you sent it to me. You don't need to be a creative. Uh, you don't need to have a creative background to succeed in a creative business. Talk to us, uh, Meredith, about what does that mean to you and how did that manifest in your business? Yeah. So I definitely, Luann, do not have a creative background. So I spent 13 years in corporate software sales but even going one step kind of further behind, I was just sharing with you, I went to NC State in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I played soccer there for four years. And for four years, I woke up, I ate, I went to class based on my soccer schedule. And mm. I will never forget graduating and the summer after I graduated, you know, being so excited to get into the workforce and sending out my, I'm doing air quotes here, my resume, because it was pretty blank. And people, I'm again from New Jersey. So I was looking in New York city to work and they looked, um, did you not have any internships? Did you not work <laughs> in college? And I was trying to explain that, well, no, I was playing division one soccer in the ACC and I was dedicated and organized and disciplined. And I would be a great employee at, you know, company ABC. And they're like, mm, yeah, no, you, you don't have the experience. Mm -hmm. And that is really where I first realized you do whatever it is you want to be, whatever you want to be, you don't necessarily need to have had experience in that trade. And specifically for me, it's interior design. It's the creative, um, you know, the background or lack thereof that I, I didn't have, but what I was able to do and want everyone else to be able to do is translate where they are today in their current life, that be a teacher, a stay-at-home mom, which P.S. is the hardest job in the entire world. I could never do it. Um, a doctor, a lawyer. I mean, keep going on and on. Whatever you are doing, there are transferable skills that you can now take into, for example, your interior design business. And I think that's just so important to really sit down because, yes, you need to be creative to be an interior designer, but you need to have the business acumen. You mm -hmm. need to understand how to, um, so again, I mentioned I was in software sales. I spent many years pitching to CEOs and CFOs of companies. Well, I'm doing the same thing now. Right. I'm an interior designer working with highly um, educated and uh, you know people that are in, we'll call them high up positions at companies that don't have the time to sit on the phone and chat with Meredith Huck from House of Huck for an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of just my long-winded way of sharing. It's so important to take where you are today and be able to transfer those skills into where you want to be in mm -hmm. the future. Right. Well, and you know, we talk about them. I, I labeled them 100 years ago on the podcast, our Eric Award transferable skills, <laughs> because <laughs> Eric Award was on the podcast within, I think, the first seven or eight or 10 podcasts. And she was the first one that, you know, brought that idea to light to me and, you know, to all of us. But it was the first time somebody clearly mentioned how things that you do in other areas of your life, whether it be a previous career or just di different areas of your life, you 
bring those skills, you transfer those skills to what you do in your design firm. And then the aha moment for me was when she said that she, you highlight them, that you tell people about them. And so the thing is, Meredith, what's interesting is that I had the opposite experience and I, it is a direct experience in hiring Kim, who has now been with us for going on 15 years, I have 14 years, whatever it is, and now is a part owner of Window Works. But she came to and applied for a job with, with us at Window Works when she was like 22 years old or something. And so she was only a year out of college. She has a degree as an interior designer. And I put out an, um, a job ad for a window treatment specialist. And she saw the ad and she had only one year, less than a year experience in the field. And it was with a design firm and the design firm wasn't heavy on window treatments or anything like that. And her college job work was not in the field. But what's funny is when I read her resume, I had the exact opposite reaction that the, the, the people that you were interviewing had. Her college resume, her extracurricular activities, every single one, first of all, she was on the dance team and had risen to be the dance captain, I want to say, by her junior year. Go, Kim. Right. And the thing is, and then, and it was whatever the other, that was the one that stuck out to me, but whatever the other curriculars were, it was each time she had responsibility with that curricular activity. She emerged at some level of leadership. And, you know, I never played division one ball, but my, both of my girls did. And I know darn well what it means to have a responsibility in a college environment to a team, a group, an organization. And I'd imagine dance was no different. And so where those people were like, oh, you don't have any office experience, what they missed was your discipline and your tenacity and your understanding that what I do affects what everybody else does on this team. And if I'm tired today and I don't feel like giving my best, it's going to affect everybody else. And that, those are skills that you can't teach somebody. That's in Absolutely. you, right? I, I can teach oh you gosh. drapes. I can teach you software, but I can't teach you to see the company mission vision and buy into it and really own it. And when you're on a, any kind of dance team, you know, sports team, that's exactly what you're doing. You're buying into the company culture and putting it ahead of your own desires and saying, this is for all of us. We'll create this together, right? Absolutely. I, I think we knew each other in a prior life because <laughs> I have been saying you can. T so one of my um, jobs in corporate software sales was at ADP. HR mm -hmm. and payroll company. And I remember going to this interview in Boston. And again, they're looking at my resume and they're like, mm, we kind of are looking for like five to seven years experience. You have yeah. zero. And I'm like, you don't understand. You could teach payroll in right. a, a classroom. You could teach HR. <laughs> I can go get a certificate, sir. You cannot teach the work ethic that I will bring right. to this organization. You cannot teach my pe the people skills. You cannot teach my organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you can to a certain degree, but I just have that innate ability to go and get it done. Right. And I got the job and it was a great job. Um, but I just think, you know, you're, you're right. You, you can teach, yes, different fabrics, drapery, yeah. how to hang, how to install, but being organized and disciplined, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that is, um, it's not for everyone. So if you're a teacher listening to this, you're a dental assistant, you're an office manager, you're a lawyer, you can be an interior designer. Yes, you just have to passion. stop. Exactly. And really think about, to our point earlier, those transferable skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, having been an athlete and all of our kids involved in sports, you know, I look for that on a resume, quite frankly, especially if I'm hiring a young person. <laughs> so, and, and it doesn't, and, yeah. you know, the athletic, the athletics stand out, but like, I, I also know if somebody was seriously involved in musical theater or, you know, whatever it is, the point is that involvement as a young person is a commitment that it, it, I watched my girls do D1 softball and they didn't, neither one of them did it for four years because of the overwhelming responsibility of it. Yeah. It's literally all nine months of the school year, like from September until May, you are at the mercy of the team and you've got to, you know, you've got to have some, you know, get up and go gumption <laughs> to do it. So, so I love it. It's not, yeah, that's not easy in college either when, you know, you could be out hanging out with your friends and, mm -hmm. but you got practice at 5am in the morning because you're right. the off season sport and it's time to get, get going. So 
I mean, let that just be your sign that you can do this. You can do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. if you just really take a step back and figure out, okay, what am I doing today that can be transferred, you know, to tomorrow? Right. Exactly. And it's funny because even that little, um, it's funny because again, just to go on taking this make, if you're looking to make the switch from a job or a career, even if you are, like you said, stay at home, mom, har hardest job ever, a hundred percent agree. I did it for six weeks. I'm like, yeah, I'm not cut out for this. <laughs> I'll come back and love you at six o'clock. Oh a whole lot that. at six o'clock. I'll love you a whole lot. <laughs> you know, but there are things, there are elements of everything that you do. And I think that's really what I'm hearing as your message, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a stay at home mom, whether you're like an Erica Ward's case where she was, um, a finance product. She was a project manager and for, um, when I think about it, like uh, property development, if I remember properly. I just remember the budgets being super huge in the hundreds and, uh, and millions. And her saying when she first started her firm, you know, if I can manage a budget and bring it in on time and on budget for this type of project, you know, I can do it for your living room. Like just, you know, yeah. like well, it'll, it'll be fine. About <laughs> Meg Moulton, you had her, have you had on her on yes. twice? I yes. remember the first one though, healthcare sales. Yes. She yes. had no business. Be I mean, it, yes. she yeah. is, no. I actually was just in Charleston last weekend, like searching for her, by the Aww, way. Um, she's such a sweetie. That episode was amazing, both of them. But, you know, she told her story also, like I, I didn't have an interior design background. She was in healthcare sales. Right. Yep. Um, and now look at her. Yes. <laughs> and and you think okay about first. it, like that's an on the road salesperson. That is oh, yeah. walking in, cold calling, you know, doctor's offices, you know, facilities saying, hey, do you want my stuff? That is literally a transferable skill for walking into clients. And, you know, to your point, when you're working at the upper levels of design, the higher level luxury of design, you know, I've often said on the show that you better develop your negotiation skills. You better develop your sales skills because the people that you are working with, they're doing it all day for sport. Like if you like you're here in Connecticut Area. You're dealing with traders and Wall Street or, you know, families and all the things. And, you know, they'll just negotiate for sports. So, so oh, you know, yes. you're kind oh, of like yes. Megan cut her teeth with selling to professionals. So to bring that skill over to her presentations for design, I'm sure, is one of the reasons why she was so successful out of the gate. Right. And and yes, in that specific example as well, I think being able to speak um, and articulate yourself to people. You're mentioning traders. They also probably don't have the time to, uh, you know, go back and forth. They want something and they want it now. And maybe you wouldn't spend twenty thousand dollars on a custom sofa, but they might. So mm -hmm. go in there with conviction. Tell them how much it costs, and take your six seconds of awkward silence and you know see what they say. Right. Um, I think that's also important. Not not, um, you know getting in your own head. Right. And, like I always like, tell you, you know, you, you give them the respect. You're, you're there as the professional. They want to know your best professional opinion. They don't want to know yep. what you could afford. <laughs> like it's like, right. <laughs> yeah. Let them tell you no. Right. And if exactly. that's fine, then keep on moving, but um, right. don't yeah, save your clients from... money. That's what I always say. Right. And yes. you, just to spend a moment back on the, the stay at home mom, I remember Christy Lou was on the podcast years ago and she, if I recall correctly, has four kids, I want to say it's four or five kids and there's a set of twins in there. And you know, she, I remember her talking about like, I have this house organized to a T, you know, you, at the time, I think when I, when I interviewed her, her oldest were I think the I think the twins are the oldest. I'm I'm not sure I remember this. Like four or five years ago, I interviewed her, um, but they were like maybe twelve, and they were the oldest out of four or oh five. Oh my gosh! And she was like, "If you think managing your interior design project is going to be challenging for me, you're out of your mind." <laughs> like I run four kids and a husband who is a doctor and this house, so you know there has to be back patches and backpack backpacks ready and soccer cleats ready and science projects ready like you know and that's the thing to not underestimate that that chess game that you play as a mother of having all of the things ready the groceries in the house and all the stuff and the all house the organized things. and the laundry that is project management oh my goodness yes and again like do, uh, 
because I think I have so many girlfriends that are stay at home moms that just, they look at me and they say, oh my gosh, how do you do it? I'm like, how do I do it? My kids are in daycare. That's how I do it. <laughs> exactly. like, you are doing the hard thing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And to not, um, not underestimate those skills because you, yes, I, I look at my girlfriends that are stay at home moms and say, how do you do it? Right. Because your house is clean and your meals are ready and the kids, you know, you didn't forget the cleats or the shin guards or whatnot. So that's, I, I mean, I'm sure we have, you have many listeners that are stay at home moms that are, would love to get into this, but how and when and why. Um, but as the wise Luann once said, if not you, then who? So, you know, go do it, right? <laughs> love it. I love it. I love it. So awesome. I love the encouragement there, the practical advice that to just do a self-assessment, um, whether you're working for someone else, you're in a corporate job, you're in another business, you're working, you know, you're a stay-at-home parent, you know, just do a self-assessment on what are the critical skills that I am actively doing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis that make me successful at whatever it is you're presently doing because when you boil them down you will see what transfers there and if the only thing it does Meredith is give you the courage to say I can run an interior design business right that's really the I'm taking away the germ of what this part of the interview is for you that don't put yourself don't count yourself out, like figure out what it is and use that as the encouragement you need to realize that you can follow this passion if it's what it is. Is that, am I picking it up right? You are picking up what I'm putting down. Right. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Good, 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 good. I love it. I love it. Okay. So next thing that you mentioned is you can make more money in your first year than you had in corporate if you stay organized and disciplined. Key part of that sentence. (laughs) So talk to us about it. Okay. So I know sometimes finances are a bit taboo, but I yearn for somebody, you know, a year ago, two years ago, four years ago to like kind of sort of tell me if I kind of sort of could make some money doing this design thing. And I'm here to tell you that you absolutely can. When I started the business full time, July 7th of 2021, I had a goal of hitting the six figure mark of uh, net revenue. So in like in my pocket, not gross, coming home to Meredith Huck after a year. And I thought, okay, if I can do that, sure, maybe I wouldn't be where I was in corporate software sales, but I felt like it could be attainable. That would be me saying, okay, like I can do this. It With a year with no creative background, as we just discussed, I hit the six figure mark, I can do this. Well, I hit that at the 10 month mark. Um, wow. You absolutely positively can make your side hustle a six figure and beyond career. Um, and I have had many people reach out to me that are teachers, or I think I mentioned earlier, a, um, a dental assistant re- recently reached out and they were they actually shared their income with me. And I thought, Oh my gosh, what are you guys doing? Do yeah. it. Go yeah. jump. Yeah. You can make in your first year, you can make more than where you're at now. And I appreciate Luann, that is really scary. Mm. And I don't want to um, hide the fact that I do have the, I'm in a position where my husband was very, very supportive and said, make zero dollars. I don't care. Mm. You know, you want to do this, go for it. I understand there are others that don't have that safety net, if you will, Mm -hmm. which makes it even scarier. Um, but I, so I have a course out side hustle at a six figures, how to leave corporate for your dream life. And what I want is for everyone to understand how to bridge that gap. Because I think there are so many great, great people that you've interviewed on this podcast. I mentioned Meg Mullen, Katie McFarlane. Oh, I love Sarah Lynn Brennan, Sandra Funk, who once you have that business, they share process and procedures and templates and design presentations, which I've, you know, I actually hired Katie from Dakota Design Company, and I'm so glad I did. Um, But I'm really catering to that market, if you will, that still has that side hustle that doesn't know how to take this interior design business full time. Um, And to your point, you do have to stay organized. You do have to stay disciplined, but it is so attainable. Mm. It really, really, really is. And if you see, I mean, you can make money in your design fee, of course, a monthly management fee. There's markup on product, right? So you have your margin that you're taking home. There are just a number of different revenue streams. 
um, I have a buddy of mine, Barry. He's half of, I don't know if you've, uh, the Brownstone Boys. They're out of Brooklyn. They renovate Brownstones. Oh. And he and I were actually in corporate software sales two jobs ago. Um, he quit on a Tuesday. I quit on a Thursday. He <laughs> took his design full time. I, I gave it one more go in corporate. And he is now has an additional revenue stream in sponsorships. So he companies pay him to share their products on Instagram and YouTube. So there are so many different revenue streams that you can utilize um, when you are an interior designer. And again, if you take a step back and really look at it from a more holistic view, I mean, the sky's the limit. I know that's like such a cliche, corny saying, but it is. It mm. really is. So th first of all, 100% on all of it, and I agree, and I love it. And I just want to pick a little bit of it apart. So yeah. um, one of the things that I know from you know the emails and the messages that I get is that designers, two things, they will often spend more time in the space of selling retail furniture before they go to trade sources and you know spend way some spend months some spend years you know settling for the 10 or 20 percent that the retailers give you and it's and and i feel like there is a learning curve there because usually when i'm at a live event and somebody says something about it and somebody else says well you got to sell you know trade sources then you know the ant the, the person comes back with i don't know how to do it so did you come out of the gate you mentioned that as one of your revenue sources did you come out of the gate uh, do, going to trade sources meredith or did you have your period of time whether it was weeks or months or continues at retail what are you doing of course i did not start out of the gate i had to fail on my own. <laughs> so this is I was the part designer. we have to make sure we share, right? The failure yes. part, right? And it's okay to fail. It's That's okay it. as long as you're learning from it. Um, so I was, yes, we, I started out and I, not only did I use retail Luann, but I told you, if you hire me, I will pass along some of the discount. Oh, oh my gosh. That's so sweet. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Don't, if you are listening, do not do that. Um, it, believe it or not, that actually didn't really attract clients no, by right? saying that. Um, I don't know if you know this, but like Pottery Barn and Crate and Barrel and Serena and Lily, they all every month have their sale and do 20% off also. Um, the reason I don't, I'd say 90% uh, is to the trade. I, I certainly, uh, you know, for accessories or every now and yeah. again, I'll, I'll go, I'll find like the perfect, like the Fay West Elm nursery rug I'm obsessed with. So I'll throw that in a nursery. But <laughs> you're not making money there. And the amount of time it takes you to find it and source it and get the sample and order it. And oh, darn it, there's a tracking, a shipping delay. Let mm -hmm. me relay to my client. Oh, goodness. Now it's out of stock. It's like it, you, lo you lose money. You really do. Right. And um, another thing is it's not unique, right? Right. Everyone has access to that. And again, I'm not knocking. I love Pottery Barn and Crate and Barrel and our house. Absolutely. But the, the, the world is your oyster if you're going to the trade. And one thing I would like to share too, there are, you know, different buying groups that you can also be a part of because I'll just give you um, four hands. That's a, a quite a popular wholesaler that a lot of designers use. There are spending thresholds. So, and I don't know the top one because I'm not in it, but let's say you need to have $150,000 in furniture to get 40% off. I, I, I'm again, I'm not in that threshold, so I'm making it up a bit, but right. I'm, I'm not there. I've been in business for 11 months. So I'm part of a buying group where I'm actually able to take advantage of that pricing. You pay a kickback to, um, to the, the account holder essentially, but it's such a lucrative business and a, it's such a huge part of my business that I, in the beginning, even had, um, you know, some lower design fees because in the back of my mind, I knew, well, I'm renovating a, you know, primary bedroom and I'm going to make about 40% margin on that. So it would be worth it. So I can get the pictures not to parlay into my third point here, but to get the pictures so I could build my portfolio and everything is just a bit of a snowball effect after mm. that. So I have to, you had no idea that I was going to say this, and I just have to say it uh, here, is that I know that the buying groups 
can be good and help you in your business. But I've also in real time recently, this is, you know, 2022, have learned of um, situations where designers are getting left hung out to dry. Oh, yes. And, oh, yes. you know, because they're giving their money and giving their order to whoever and they're not being fulfilled and so and they're not the one placing the order with the factory and so their money their clients money is gone and they have no recourse so i'm not saying listen i have good designer friends that use the that are part of the buying groups swear by them so i'm not advocating them and i'm not saying you know, don't use them. But this is a huge podcast now. We have tens of thousands of designers listening, people from all over, all different levels of business expertise. And I just feel like public service announcement, I have to say that you need to do due diligence and you need to go in with Absolutely. eyes wide open if you are going to put your money in a place like this because you can do it successfully. I'm not saying you cannot, but if, you know, like, I just feel like I have, to, it's just come to that now that I, ha I can't just blanketly um, say, yeah, Luann, you know, I heard it on Luann's podcast. It's a great thing. Like, I, you know, it has to come with a warning. It's like a cigarette label on TV. And at I the bottom, the Surgeon General says this causes cancer. <laughs> cancel, cancel. Totally. Proceed with caution. Um, yeah. I will. So again, I'm 11 months in. I actually just yesterday uh, reached out to the Brian group that I'm in saying, you know, I think I'm, I'm all set here. I will say personally, my experience, I have not had a negative experience. Right. Um, it was very good for that first year mm -hmm. and I'm excited to begin building my own accounts. I actually, my, um, my build.com rep. So Ferguson owns build. I didn't even know this. They sell visual comfort. They sell Korean co they sell Hudson mm -hmm. Valley lighting hooker furniture. Um, so I do buy a lot through them, which has been very helpful because I, I sometimes even get to avoid a receiver, which there's some, um, again, as a, uh, being in my first year, I'm certainly looking at finances and right. where can I kind of dial back on some costs, but no, Luann, I am glad you shared that because, um, while I do think they can be helpful, I would also say, yes, proceed with caution. There are some though. Um, and please tell me if, if you disagree, uh, more uh, reputable maybe is the word I'll use, mm -hmm. like a uh, side door, mm -hmm. lower margins, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's monitored a, a bit more. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've, uh, I don't know, I don't have, have any personal knowledge of side door and there, I mean, I heard of them, but I don't have any dealings with them. I could never say, you know, I know good or bad. I've not heard a single thing positive or negative. Um, and, and the thing, what I'm saying about this, what, here's what I do know to be true, that way more designers have used these services without mm -hmm. incident than designers who have used them with scary stories that I know to be true that I know to be true. Yep. So, you know, but it's, you know, the same thing why some people won't fly in a plane because, you know, sometimes <laughs> planes don't make it, you know what I'm saying? And the, the thing that the thing about it is, is that the bad stories, the scary stories are really scary. And so I, 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 I agree with you. There's a, there's probably a place for it um, as long as eyes wide open. And again, not being a active working interior designer. If I had firsthand knowledge doing it myself, I would be much more inclined to speak directly on the pro or con or do it or don't do it. But not having that and only hearing, you know, the good stories and also the horror stories. I, I, it, the podcast is just at a place where it can't just be a blanket, um, you know, like you, Meredith, you were listening to the podcast a year or two years ago, getting ready to start your business. You know, how many things did I say on the podcast? You're like, Luann said it. It must be true. <laughs> like, right? Uh, everything. I am here because, well, literally I'm here because because this is your podcast. But no, I'm I'm an interior designer, Luann. I'm not blowing smoke because I have listened to countless episodes and taken tidbits and ran with it. Right. 
Right. So yeah, and that's yes, that's what I have to actually acknowledge and understand now that there's somebody out there listening, and there's certain things that I have to have a little Surgeon General's warning on. <laughs> but I, I do it. what I do also hear out of that lesson. And that I love is that you should be, as a designer, striving for as much trade resources as possible um, because, you know, really the retailer is a retailer. Pottery Barn is a retailer. So what are you doing? You're being another retailer there? Like it's illogical, okay? It's like buying a full meal at a restaurant and then setting up a lemonade stand and selling the meal again. It's like, that's exactly what it is. I bought this from this fine five-star restaurant and now I'm going to sell it to you instead of $300 for the soup to nuts meal for $280. Like stop. Like it's just dumb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, okay. Yep. Now, now it has its place. Like you said, you know, you said 90%, maybe it's 85%. I'm okay with that. There's certain accessories. You walk into a place, a lamp or whatever it is, and you're yeah. just like, it's perfect all day long. It's not your bread and butter. The bulk of your money should be coming from, as you mentioned, multiple revenue streams, your design fees, your actual uh, markup on trade furniture, um, you know, and wherever else, you know, you know, procurement fees, whatever you want to do. Okay. But um, yay. I love it. I love it too. It's just a great um, lesson to understand in there. Now, staying organized and disciplined in your first year is not easy because in your first year, it's not easy in any year for crying out loud. It's not easy in your 40th year. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> okay. But in the first year, I think it's a, an, it's a particular challenge because you have yet to set up process and system and you have to actually yet understand what is your process and system for things. So can you take yourself back in this last year, Meredith, and give some, you know, think about some space and time where you were like, ah, that was when I learned that. Like I, the fourth time that this happened and I was like, I had to change and create a process or a system or address something. Anything that you can share that might be helpful for a colleague? Absolutely. Um, I feel like, it's back when I was a kid and I made a mistake and was like, oh, yeah, I guess dad was right there. <laughs> so many mistakes and so many times to the, the point of, you know, we just discussed purchasing retail versus trade. Not that that's a mistake, but I, I don't do that anymore. And I think, gosh, everyone told me not to do that. And I still <laughs> did it. Um, you know, I think one thing, so even before process, just getting the business set up. And again, this is kind of where the side hustle to six figures comes in, but getting the business set up the business bank account. Uh, me, I went ahead and got an accountant right away. You certainly don't need to, but numbers, not my jam. So let's go ahead and outsource that. Um, a contract. I think so many times people just think, oh, but you know, he's so nice. She's so nice. She would never sue me. It's not about getting sued. Um, although certainly, yes, that's great uh, to have a, a lock, lock solid contract if you do get sued. But, you know, having having some of those documents in place before even your first client. And then I think, and this is something that Katie taught me um, when I hired Dakota Design Company for an intensive, it was a week long program, but you know, write your process down right now. Stop, drop, write your process down. Oh, you don't have a process? No, you do. It might be, mm -hmm. you know, an SHIT show, but write it down. What, you know, you get an inquiry. What do you do? You have a template. Great. Oh, you don't have a template. You just respond off the cusp. Okay. That's your current process. Then once you are all done with this process, good, bad, or indifferent, that's when you really do need to pick, pick it apart. What can you templatize? What's repeatable? What is, um, you know, each design presentation is going to be very different, but do you at least have a shell of what that design presentation is that again, you can, because most people in their first year, second year, um, they don't have employees. So you're not kicking this over to your social media manager to put on Instagram, right? You're not right. having marketing coordinator put your design presentation together. And if you are, awesome. I'm not there yet. It's me, myself, and I. Um, so I think, again, being able to set the business up from the beginning correctly, like before you need an accountant, get all your chart of accounts like squared away. Little mm -hmm. things like that. Do you have your business credit card? Do you have your business bank account? Um, and just have everything in place because I promise you, if you are, again, organized, if you are disciplined, I know I keep repeating those words, but it is so true. You are going to be so busy. Right. So busy. 
I mean, it, 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 I, so I actually have my real estate license, Luann. Hmm. And I thought, okay, I'm not, we talked a little bit about being a stay at home mom. I'm not made for that life. It is way too hard for me. I love my kids so, so, so much, but I'm a better mom because they are in school and I am home working. And when I'm working, I'm working. And when I'm with them, I'm totally with them. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. they were in school this summer. They're three and four. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to lean on my real estate license. Like I'm going to sell a couple homes. Cause like also, by the way, I'm not doing this. I mean, I'm doing it for fun, but like I'm in it to make money. Right. This is my business. Sure. So I'm going to sell a couple homes. I'll do some design in the background. I sold one house like on accident. I was so busy with inquiries. People, oh my gosh, I've been wanting to renovate this. I've been wanting to design that. And a year later, almost a year later, I took jobs this summer that there is last summer. There is no way I'd take again, mm. but that's okay. I got pictures out of it. I built relationships out of it. I got social content out of it, which in turn brought me new, um, new clients. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's also important to, um, to remember, especially in that first year. I love it. I love it. Um, w- one of the things I don't want to gloss by, I want to make sure we talk about is setting up the business as a business. That's basically what you're saying. It's like, you know, you, you have a lawyer and you get your contracts in order, you get your business entity declared. You, you know, I believe that unless you have a finance brain, like maybe you have been a stay at home parent for two years or 15 years, whatever it is. If you're the person that ran the family's finances, cause usually there's one in the group, right? In the pair, then it's you not probably, me. yeah, it's not me either. <laughs> like, uh, you know, hello. I know you just all like, what, really? <laughs> But the point is, is that 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 you if you're that person in your life, then you maybe don't need a bookkeeper out the gate. But you do need to know, like you said, the chart of accounts for a design firm like you cannot just assume all of it's going to transfer. So if you are not that person in your world, then I am fully like bookkeeper from almost day one, like within weeks or months. And if you are, yes. then you can be that person for weeks, months, or years, but go find out what you don't know about bookkeeping for a design firm. That's the the caveat there. And I also love that you mentioned that your contracts are not in case someone sues you. Your contracts aren't, you know, it's like you said, colleagues say, oh, I have such nice customers, you know, clients, they would never sue me. The contracts are in place. So that never happens. The contracts are there so that all of the agreements are clear up front and we don't get ourselves into a place where we have to go and be sued. Like I always, I've known it with window works for all these years. If we get to the point in a conflict with a client that we're talking about what the contract says or doesn't say, we are way down the road in conflict land. (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? It's like, By the time you're using that language, you have a real problem on your hand. And that is probably 10% of all the jobs you will ever do your whole life. But the other 90% that you never have to say those words are because the contract is solid and in place and it's understood by both parties. So I agree with getting these things. And I remember Kim Worsick from Kimberly K Interiors was on the show uh, probably two or three years ago at this point. And she was very much like you, Meredith. She was listening to the show, uh, side hustling it and, you know, you know, finally decided I can do it. I've learned so much from all the guests on the podcast, yada, yada. And the focus of the interview that her and I did was, I think we did it when she was less than a year in business as well. Um, And she kind of took it from the thing of the things I did because of the podcast and the things I wish I had done. And what sticks (laughs) out to me in that interview all these years later is the one thing that sticks out is she said, I wish I hired a bookkeeper sooner. I didn't hire it until like, I think she said three or six months in and she said doing it differently. I would have hired that sooner. So, um, love those lessons in there, Meredith. So good. Yeah. One, just one quick thing I do want to share too, Luann is, um, when I was again, two months in thinking, no, 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 I'm not going to hire an attorney. I'm not going to hire a CFO. I'm not, we're not talking about somebody on staff. Right. Okay. My contract was $650. Right. That's it. I paid, I paid the attorney. He, I had like a shell of one. He edited it. He asked questions. I answered questions, answered, done. Right. Bookkeeper, 
for me, it was so small. It was a hundred dollars a month. Right. That to me is worth it. So I, I just want to clarify that I'm not saying you need to go hire somebody to be on staff on call with a, you know, $5,000 retainer per month. No, 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 no. You just need to set the business up correctly in the beginning. Right, right, right. I, a hundred percent. You just need your documents in order, right? It's kind of like, you know, anything this again, I just want to go back to your first point of go back to what you're doing now, or if you are a currently an interior designer and this part of the conversation is kind of hitting you between the eyeballs, just go to any other part of your business where you have it locked down. And it's like, oh, right. I, I don't need to have this person 24 seven, you know, maybe it's like a, a, a renderer. You don't necessarily have a renderer on staff, but maybe, right. you know, maybe you use Duke renders, right? And when you have a great project, you hire Duke renders to do your rendering. But that's the same as your your lawyer and your, you know, other other professionals that you bring in. But you don't just say, well, I don't have a renderer on staff, so I guess I'll do my best shot at rendering <laughs> when you have no business doing no, no, it. No, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. So thinking about your... Um, people that support you, your professionals and consultants that support you in running a quote unquote, big girl business, big boy business. It's it, they don't need to be full time as you mentioned. So I love that. Right. All right. And so then the other point that you brought up to me is that you can get creative in the beginning. And I, I would argue your entire career um, <laughs> when you don't always have the money to invest and you use an example of bartering. So tell us a little bit about this uh, lesson in the last year for you, Meredith. Okay. So I think, again, it can be really scary to take that jump and I get it. And then a lot of people kind of will think, well, I don't have the money to, I mean, there's a, photo a local photographer that I would love to use, but they're $2,000 for a half day. And right now where I am in my business, um, I don't think my design fee yields a $2,000 half day photo uh, photographer. So I will carry on with that photographer in my barter example. Meg Moulton, actually, in the first episode that she was on with you, shared a little bit about how she found her photographer, which is how I found a photographer. I, brand new, I wanted to photograph my house. I didn't have any photographs for my website. And as I mentioned, I think it's really important to set up the business from the beginning. So I wanted to have a website. If I ran into someone at the store, I wanted to be able to say, oh, go check out my website. And at the time, I didn't have one. Mm. So I went to, gosh, these local Facebook mom groups are just gold mines. I tell you, you don't even have to be a mom. Right. It's a gold mine. And I found, I kind of did some hashtag searching and looked up. I found a few photographers that, in my opinion, valued social media because I think that's important, mm. but were new to the game. And I reached out to them and say, you know, hey, my name is Meredith Huck. I'm an interior designer here in coastal Connecticut. They didn't need to know that I was only doing it for two months. I just said that. I would love to have you photograph my fill in the blank living room uh, to be able to utilize for your own portfolio. You know, what do you think? And I was able to get a photographer to photograph my home for zero dollars in exchange for the content. And that skyrocketed the business because not only did I have a portfolio now on my website, Luann, mm. but I had the little vignettes. I had the little mm. styled bookshelf and the styled nightstand that I now went out to social on. I linked to my like to know it. I mean, I, it just compounded, like I said, this snowball effect. So going back to these transferable skills, when I was director of partnership, uh, channel partnerships at my last job, I had to get creative on how without a budget, we could make um, make some waves with the partners within my software sales job. And I would get creative and I would take my partner and I would take my company and we would do a live, this was hashtag COVID life, like Zoom presentation and see what clients of theirs we could get, what clients of ours we could get. And then we cross pollinated the clients. And next thing you know, we just spent $0 on this event. And I have some new clients now that I got to walk away from. So same concept in this example. Again, it's the photographer. Go to um, your local Facebook. I live in Milford, Connecticut, Milford, Connecticut Facebook group 
and see who else is on there that you think could benefit from, in this example, having pictures of a beautiful home in their portfolio. I actually did this for my wedding. When we got married, there was a photographer I loved and he really wanted to get into weddings, but he was a lifestyle videographer at the time. So he did our wedding or video for like pennies. Oh my gosh, pennies. Because he we got married on the beach in Newport, Rhode Island, mm. and he wanted to have that mm. in his back pocket too. Nice. So again, it's just it's all about just being creative and, mm. and bartering and offering to style your friend's mantle in exchange for pictures. Heck, go to Hobby Lobby, go to Home Goods, buy a bunch of stuff. Right. I hope Home Goods isn't listening to this. <laughs> style a bookshelf. And bring it back. Right, right. No, it's so true. And it's so funny because, you know, you mentioned that you, you bartered with your wedding. We literally bartered our entire catering with the, the facility that we did our I wedding and for draperies for two ballrooms. <laughs> and I, we bartered my wedding dress for window treatments. It was, and I, I'm going to just sh- share this with you because for me, it was so crazy pants you're talking 1986 my wedding dress I remember as soon as I got engaged I was like I gotta get bride magazine I gotta look through I gotta pick my dress and I came across this dress I was like that is the dress I want and I you know there was a bridal shop across the street from us one of our window work showrooms we had three at the time and I walked in and I was like hey you know uh my fiance and I own the, the business across the street and here's the wedding dress that I would really love to have do you have this wedding dress and she's like oh you know um I don't have it but I it's a vendor that I use and I can get it and I said to her can you tell me how much it costs and she's like why don't I get it in and you could try it on I'm like lady I don't want the dress on my back first <laughs> right so I was like no 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 tell me how much it costs now this is 1986. I'm not a person raised with any amount of money. I have no, my most expensive dress at that point is probably a prom dress that was $100, right? And I have no idea what to expect, what a wedding, you can't just Google this stuff, stuff then. It wasn't like, what a wedding dress it costs, right? She comes out, and I will never forget it, Meredith. She told me it was $986. Oh my gosh. I was like, oh, I'm probably not gonna have that dress <laughs> like this, right? And so I was just like, whoa like my brain automatically was like just blown away and so I just smiled there I said oh thank you so much because you want me to order the dress in and I just said to her you know I, I, I it's gorgeous but I don't think it's my pocketbook thank you so much right so I go back across the street and I'm standing there and I turn around and I'm like sitting in our showroom and I'm looking over and her window treatments look like crap like (gasps) literally and I'm just like huh and so the next day I walked back in there and I said hey she's like oh hi and I said you know and she goes I said I really love that dress I like I really do and I said and we sell window treatments I said maybe we could work something out and she was like oh stop it and yep and she or and it, the funny the end of the story that was so funny is that when the dress came in a month or so later, whatever it was, and I went and put the dress on. First, I got my mother there. I got my aunt Honey there. I got the Vincennes there. And she's like, what is your fiance doing here? I'm like, I, you know, I want him to see the dress. She's like, it's bad luck. I'm like, there's no such thing as bad luck. Like, stop. Okay. So I put, because I also was like, we're going to barter this. Like, <laughs> you, you like the dress too, right? So I put the dress on and I'm just like, this is my dress. And so everybody's like, it's beautiful, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, let me get you some others that I put aside for you. I'm like, I don't need any others. She's like, she's like, back and forth, back and forth. I'm like, this is the dress. She's like, wait, you're going to try on one dress? I'm like, yes, this is it. Like, like bag it up, sign it up, do whatever you got to do. <laughs> wait, is this a real story? Yes. Stop 100%. it. Wait, so did you get her the window treatment? Wait, you think I'm making stuff up on my Ooh, podcast, man. Meredith? <laughs> uh, I don't. I'm just, I wish you could see my face right now. I, this is, this speaks to my soul. Like yes. good for, mic drop. Yeah. Good yeah. for you. That's, no, and then we did we the same thing for the, for the, for the, for the place. Like we walked in, like what happened was the place called for window treatments we got engaged in march and we were married in september and because we were with with each other for several years and i was like let's just get this done right and and so like i don't know it might have been may 
the, this really well-known wedding facility, Mayfair Farms in West Orange, if you ever heard of it back in the day, called and I walked in and she's like, we're thinking about doing, you know, all the draperies in the ballrooms. And the whole conversation, she's nice, 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 all the things. But of course, she's doing the whole, not sure what it's going to cost, if I could do one ballroom, if I could do four ballrooms, whatever it is, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't say anything on the spot because, you know, I needed Vinny's consent to like just start to borrow thousands of dollars. One thousand dollars is one thing, but you know, you know, multiple five, you know, five figures of them is not a good thing. So I go back and I said to him, I said, "What do you think we do the same thing that we just did with the dress?" He's like, "Go for it." <laughs> so I walked back in and I brought all the drapery samples and everything, and she kept saying, "You know, what is this going to cost?" And I said, "You know." I got an idea. We want to get married. You know, how do you feel about we barter this? And and we worked out that, you know, we would do, I think what we did was, because now it's like, are you going to give me costs and I'm giving you retail or am I going to give you retail and you're going to give right, me right, costs? Right. Like, so we just decided, do what your price is. I will give you what the price is for the draperies. If there was no deal on the table, you give me the price what it would be for the wedding. If there's no deal on the table and we would just simply flip flop it. So we bartered our retail. You know, but that was great. I mean, I think, you know, when it was done, I'm trying to remember if it was either so close, the numbers that we both looked at each other and said, let's wash this because we both knew we were bartering retail, not net. Right. Or it was like under three thousand dollars at one or the other owed the other one. I, I don't recall. Sure. But <laughs> which is pennies at that point, yes, you know, if you're looking exactly. wow. So I, yeah, I'm all for I, figuring I, out creative ways to get what you want. <laughs> I, and and again, if like I'm thinking, okay, you're a teacher and there's this photographer and they have middle yes. school kids, like do you offer to tutor them right. and she or he takes pictures for an hour? I mean you really yes. can get we're using the buzzword creative, but like, that's okay because we're on a creative podcast, but <laughs> just get creative. And it's mm -hmm. Louie, it's kind of fun. Yeah. It's like, a oh, high. it is. I get a oh rush out of it. The whole negotiation part I of it, I love. Today. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and and it reminds me of Mikkel Welch's show. Now you may not have listened to the show, Meredith, because he is also a few, I keep bringing up shows that are years old and you probably haven't heard all of them. But... Oh, I've gone back, Louie. Okay. Gone... Okay. Um, and Mikkel Welch did the same thing um, similarly. So he did it with strangers, which was interesting. Um, mm. But, and he also came up, you all know who Mikkel Welch is. I mean, he's yeah. hot. You know, big, big TV star now, right? And the designer TV star. Great guy. So, such a beautiful soul. And he told us on the podcast how what he did was, now this is going back, I don't remember if it's 10 years ago or how many years ago when he was coming up, but Craigslist was big then. And so you're oh. suggesting the Facebook groups and things like yep. that, whatever the medium is, it is irrelevant. But he was single and he was able to be agile. And so what he would do is he first started in the community that he lived in. I want to say Atlanta, but I could be making that up. And he would put an ad in a Craigslist like gigs and say, I'm an interior designer. You know, you know, do you need your living room, dining room, whatever, um, redone? I'll do it for you at no charge. You buy all the products and things and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he would get the, the client and he would read or look at the space and get the client. Then he would go and back into Craigslist and put the gig in for the photographer. I'm an interior designer. I've got a project in this, you know, community. This is the thing, blah, blah, blah. I'm doing the work for free. You want to do the design for the, the photographs for free and we'll both get portfolio out of it. What, totally. how much he put in the ad, you know, I'm totally whatever. But, and, and the thing is after he sort of saturated his own community, then he, I remember he put one in New York and he was like, ba ba ba, designer looking for work if you ba ba ba. And when he got a gig in New York, he went up and he stayed and he slept on the sofa of his friend's house, you know, while he did the gig in New York. And then he was like, let me put it in, you know, California. He slept on a sofa. Yeah. yeah. And now look at him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's like to me when we talk about this part of your um, email to me with get creative in the beginning if you don't have the money to invest in your business. You know, these are the things. These are people have done it ahead of you where they've done completely wild things like, you know, going and sleeping on a sofa in a different state in order to do this to – you know, you working with somebody in your own community and having a nice deal, blah, blah, blah. Like, but the point is, 
when you do think about it, what does somebody else need that I can deliver? And what is the value of that? And what do they have that I can deliver? And when you can, you know, come to the table, and I do want you to repeat your sentence, Meredith, because when you first told it, I got all involved in my wedding story, and I want to go back to it. You didn't say, oh, hi, I have this opportunity. You said to t tell a sentence that you said again. It was very good. You know, absolutely. You do not. You want to go in there with your confidence and say, hey, I, I'm, again, I'm an interior designer in coastal Connecticut. That's what I say. Because guess what? I am. Right. And it doesn't matter if I have two months, two years, or 22 <laughs> years. It doesn't matter if I have, you know, my degree in interior design or not. I'm an interior designer, period, end of sentence. And this is what I'm offering you. Would you like to be a part of it? Right, right. And yeah. you know what? It's okay if they say no. Right. Awesome. Right. On to the next. And I really do mean that because I've been t told no more times than I've been told yes. But the times I've been told yes have been, I mean, they're, they are. They have been life-changing. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to the first point when we were talking about um, transferable skills, saying things with conviction. I'll never forget being at a party with my husband. Um, maybe it was in October of the first year, you know, my first year. And somebody asked what I did. And I was like, I'm an interior designer. And he looked at me and is like, when have you ever been shy? You're an interior designer. Next question. Right. Period. Right. Like you are, and you just you, say it, say it, say it in the mirror. That's what you do. Um, and you're going to be great. I love it. I love that your husband has, uh, we, we also skimmed over that, his support of you in saying, oh, you know, yeah. go follow this and do this. If you don't make any money, you know, we'll figure it out. But then also that support right there, like Meredith, come on. <laughs> yeah. And you <laughs> Big know girl what? Panties. For, I'm a for those people designer. That are, absolutely. And for those people, like I said, that do have, I, I feel fortunate that yes, I do have the safety net of my husband that has a great job and whatnot. But um, I said to myself, now he didn't say this to me, but I said, I can't not work. And my daughter was two and a half at the time. My son was had just turned four. So now they're both three and four. If by the time Kennedy, my little one, gets to kindergarten and I feel as though I haven't, you know, I haven't made it, I'm not successful, guess what? I'll go back to corporate. Mm -hmm. I'll get a job in a heartbeat. It will be no problem. But like, Again, if not you, then who? If right. not now, then when? You have to do it. There's never a good time. I, this is such a silly example, but I think about a college friend that was breaking up with her boyfriend and was like, well, it's Christmas, and then, oh, then it's New Year's, and then it's our anniversary, and then it's Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> Literally, there's never just break up with them. There's never you're you're gonna miss your birthday present. Yes, right. onward. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. So good. So many good things. I know that I could probably keep asking you questions, and you could keep <laughs> sharing. You know, the wisdom of the first year is is really critical because it it does. You know, it's like childbirth pain. It fades <laughs> when you're three, five, six, ten years in business. It's it's sometimes hard to remember how hard the first year, two years can be. Um, and and that not that we've we've dwelled on the hard parts of it here, but I think in understanding that this is the lesson of this particular episode is go in eyes wide open and prepare. And like you said, have the organization and the discipline and the first year is still going to have its bumps, but it doesn't Absolutely. have to be as hard as, you know, some chicken with running around without a head, right? That's the difference. Yep. You know, the first year is, I guess what I'm trying to say there is the first year is going to be challenging regardless, but are you creating more challenge than you need by not paying attention and staying disciplined and organized? I think that's really the differentiator there. You know, I have um, obviously I've had um, the great privilege of working with many designers one on one through the chairman of the board program. And it does sometimes I think one of the things that I I have have had to tap into in you know those beginning years of oh yeah Vin didn't take a salary for 18 months oh yeah I used to work and go on customer appointments on Saturdays and Sundays and nights and you know window works wasn't always just this 40 year old business with referrals coming through it like a freight train it you know I used to go and knock on 
doors. I used to walk wow. up and down the streets and say, you know, your awning looks pretty crappy. Do you think you need a new one? <laughs> of course, that was inside voice, you know. But I literally, we we built the business from nothing. And there was no social media. You, you had to save your money to put an ad in the paper. And it was $768 in 1982 oh to run an ad in the paper. And we used to be, we would, we would budget to be able to afford one once a month. Like, think wow. about it, right? And so I feel like um, it, we, you know, Amber Lewis said on the podcast one time, don't compare your beginning to someone else's middle. Absolutely. And, right? And that's a good thing to understand and know. And for me, having done so much intensive one-on-one, one-on-ones, it puts me back into, oh, yeah, how did we build Window Works? Oh, heck, <laughs> that was crazy what we did. So um, thank you, Meredith, for sharing you know, some of your journey in your first year in business. And congratulations, A, on one year in business. You know how many businesses don't see their first year yeah, completed, thanks. right? So pat on the back for that. And even if you made $10,000 this year, your first year in business, if you're still in business after a year, it's an accomplishment. And then, of course, the you know high five on cracking the six figures net to you in your first year. So yay, 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 all the way around. Thank you so much, Luann. Oh my goodness. It means a lot. I appreciate that. Like I said, I, I wouldn't literally be here without you because this is your podcast that I am on. But like I, I left corporate because of listening to so many of the podcasts. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. All right, so let's talk about these lessons that Meredith shared with us and that got my attention originally, right? The first, you don't need a creative background to succeed in a creative business. Well, I just have to say, if you listen to even more than one episode of the show, you know that this is true, right? You don't need a creative background to succeed in a creative business. What you need is you need to know how to run a business, right? I mean, that's the thing. You can develop your creative talent over the years, but if you don't have the business side down, you're just not gonna get the chance to see what you really could have made of yourself in your business, all right? And of course, we always talk about those skills, those transferable skills that come from other areas of our life and inform and enable us to succeed in our business. For Meredith, two things helped her on her rise. The discipline that she developed by being a D1 soccer player and all the years that she spent pitching CEOs and CFOs. That's some training ground right there, right? The second lesson is that you can make more money in your first year as a designer than you made in your corporate job, okay? As long as you are organized and disciplined. This is not often so easy to do in your first year because typically you have yet to set up process and systems. But you see, Meredith said, not if you wish for it. She said, if you are organized and disciplined, meaning Meredith didn't spend, spend time spinning her wheels needlessly. She did the things that she knows successful business owners do. She set up herself properly, establishing a business account and a getting a solid contract, right? I mentioned in the episode, Kim Worsick from Kimberly K Interiors. She was on the show a few years back. She said to us, looking back, one of the things that she would have done from the beginning rather than waiting. And I think if I remember, she only waited three months, okay? But she said she would have hired a bookkeeper from day one. All right, so check out that show. She's a heck of a smart lady. Another move that Meredith made that just shows her organization and discipline was hiring Katie McFarlane. All right, she didn't wait to spend time, months, years spinning her wheels, right? She went out and got the help that she needed. You see, you can do it alone. You can make your mistakes and figure it out. And you will. I know you will. But what Meredith is saying is, if you want to cross over from corporate and make six figures in year one, then you will need to invest in yourself and your business. And like I always say, we pay in time or money. Whatever we have available to us is usually how we make the decision whether we're going to pay in time or money, right? Different seasons of our life, okay? So the thing is, Meredith made a decision. There were certain things that she was going to invest in to shortcut and get to the things that would help her be profitable 
out the gate. And I get it. If you don't have the ability to do that, then you will do it with time. And that's okay too. It's 100% okay. There are 800 episodes for you to go through and learn those lessons and figure it out yourself. You're smart. You can do it. I know it, right? And then the third lesson that Meredith shared was that you can think out of the box if you don't have the money to invest in your business, right? Sometimes the expense to get into business and to get it started off the ground is is overwhelming and maybe you just don't have the access to the finances, right? But like Meredith and me, you can sometimes get what you need when you barter with people, right? All you have to do is identify someone who needs what you have, all right? You have skills, you have talents. There are things that you bring to the table and there are people out there that want them. So making a win-win, making a win-win deal is always a good thing. So put your thinking cap on and wonder, dream, think about who can you help that can help you in return. All right. The bottom line is that the first year in business is challenging, regardless of all the things that you do. Right. But the point here is you can succeed out of the gate. It does not have to take years if you are intentional, strategic and organized and disciplined. Right. Now, let's talk about Meredith's course. All of the tips on starting your business and in the first year trying to go from side hustle to six figures, how to leave your corporate job for your dream life are outlined in her course. All right. The first section is all about getting started, building your business, your strategy, hiring your CPA, all the things. The second section teaches how to set up your portfolio, how to get your social media up and running. And the last section is I'm doing it. What's the plan? I just quit. Now what? Right? The things to do in your first 90 days. Okay. So enrollment for the side hustle to six figures is opening soon. Just go to her website, houseofhuck.com. The price is $9.89, which includes her contract, which we know is a $600 value. Okay. This course comes from a lady who has made her six figures net in, in one year. All right. So she's, she's showing you the ropes. She's showing you how she did it. I have to say, it was my pleasure meeting you, Meredith. You're, you're just such a ball of energy. I just love your enthusiasm. I love your intentionality. I love your positivity, all right? And I love that you were able to come here and actually share how you did it with all of your peers. So thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for listening. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.